Hello AP Calculus AB students, Mr. Record here and we are going to take a look at our sixth video in the 3.2 series over implicit differentiation but what we're still going to be talking about is just piggybacking off of our last video that dealt with the idea of logarithmic differentiation. It's sort of a side topic, not quite related to the AP Calculus exam, but it, it can be a really nice tool to have in your arsenal um, as a Calculus 1 student. So if you remember the previous video, what we did is we took a good look at our example number five here. And I think I ran you through the gauntlet asking you all to take these four derivatives. And we probably found that a couple of them may have been a little tricky, but the fourth one was just downright mean, right? The derivative of x to the x. You really didn't have any means by which to take that derivative because we hadn't talked about the process of logarithmic differentiation and so therefore it was introduced. What I wanted to do in this video is really tackle example six but talk a little bit about why we have this x greater than zero proclamation there. Why does that have to be a part of the problem? Was that a part of this x to the x graph that we never really looked at but does it pertain to all types of functions where the base is an x and the power is an x? So let's take a look at the graph of this guy. I'm just going to move over to my graphing software here. So here we are with our TI Inspire graphing software. I'm going to turn this over to a graphing page and I'm going to enter x raised to the x and see what we've got. And what we've got is something that's very unusual. I think it's definitely worth taking a look at what's going on in this particular region. So I'm going to change my view to zoom in using a box. And I'm going to use this area here as about the upper left corner and maybe move over here for the lower right corner. And then I have a little bit better look at this very strangely behaved graph. Now, what we have to think about here is what's going on with certain values of x and it seems like this graph is pretty well behaved when x is positive but when x is negative it has a just a, a mind of its own so one of the things i thought about doing is set up a table of values to get a better look so i can use the shortcut control t to bring up my table but this table is rather limiting in that i can't type anything in it's only going to give me integer values of x and it really seems to be doing a pretty good job of spitting out some y values the only one it has trouble with is zero to the zero power which is a little bit unusual it's kind of an und uh, indeterminate form if you will so what we're going to do is i'm going to change this table settings and i want to see if i can tell the table to let us input the independent variable let us place the x value in. So I'm going to change that to ask. And then I'm going to type in some things like negative 1. Well, that doesn't seem to be a problem. It knows that negative 1 raised to the negative 1 power is negative 1, not a problem. But what if we found, let's say, a fraction? What if I was interested in, say, negative 1 half? And I'm going to enter the 1 half using the diagonal fraction bar. The calculator will understand it. And it does give us an undefined. Ah, but if I were to keep going into the negative realm, like negative 2, I'm back to having a defined value. So we have to think about what kind of values would make this graph undefined. Well, as it turns out, we're pretty much going to be restricted to using any negative that does not contain a root type of value. In other words, we need to find, we need to, to think about what power would we raise to create a square root or a fourth root or a sixth root. And it turns out that those are going to be fractions that have these even denominators. Those are causing a problem because they are forcing us to take the even root of a negative number, which we all know to be imaginary. Even if the numerator is something other than 1, as long as that denominator is some kind of even number, we're going to have a problem on our hands. But yet the graph is wanting to connect everything and make it nice and continuous, so this is the result that we get. So it's not really an accident that you see a lot of these problems defined when x is greater than 0, which means the only part of the graph that we really care about is the part that we see now, 
which means we do have a nice well-behaved function and we could certainly take the derivative and find the slope of the tangent line. Let's go back to our document and run through example six. And we're back with our example six and we have the function y equal x to the two x for x greater than zero. So to take this derivative, we are going to start off with our very important step taking the natural log of both sides. Remember, we do that so that we can perform that uh, wonderful property of logarithms that will allow this exponent 2x to lie in front of the logarithm, natural log of x. And that's a pretty powerful thing, because now we're going to be able to get at that function on the right side and take its derivative. And so our next step, which isn't going to really look like it's doing a lot. I'm just setting the stage. I'm going to take the derivative of both sides with respect to x. It's highly likely that you may not write this step out when you're practicing your own problems, and that's perfectly okay. But I wanted to make it pretty clear in this video what it is that we were trying to do. So on the left side, when we take the derivative of natural log of y with respect to x, we use implicit differentiation. That's really what the topic 3.2 is about. And we would get 1 over y times dy over dx. On the right side, we're going to use a bit of a product rule. The derivative of 2x is 2, multiply by ln of x, add 2x, and then the derivative of natural log of x is 1 over x. Next thing we're going to do is simplify the right side just a little bit. And in doing so, we end up with 2 natural log of x plus 2 as these x's cancel. And then we're going to multiply the y over to the right side. And we end up having this. But we're not going to leave it written like that for very long because I want that y to be in terms of x. And the best way to do that is call it by its original name x to the 2x power. And that would be your answer. Now you could go ahead and probably restate that domain restriction. It's, it's, a, it's a good practice to do that. I typically don't take points off of my students' papers if they don't do that unless the directions specifically ask for it. But that's going to be our derivative. I'm going to turn back to the calculator. We're going to check this answer. And here we are with our trusty TI Inspire, and I'm going to use my shortcut shift minus to take the derivative of x raised to the 2 times x power. And if you get a good look at that, that's going to match pretty much exactly what our answer was on pencil and paper, other than the fact that a 2 had been factored out. So you've seen a, a full-blown example of logarithmic differentiation. In the last video coming up, we're going to take a look at a really special version of logarithmic differentiation. I guess true reason why it's something that I like to teach in my classroom because it can definitely get students out of a bind if they're having a difficult time taking the derivative of a pretty complicated rational expression. So I want you to uh, tune in for that one and we'll see you next time.